Good day, Grade Twelves. Welcome to this next lesson in revision and preparation for Friday's exam. In our lesson yesterday, we were busy working out um, our. Wait, where were we? Um, just a second. I can't remember where we were. Oh yes, that's right. We were calculating the initial mass of the nitrogen gas. So we've got as far as working out, we've got this x minus seven times by ten to the negative four um, over 0 0.5 is equal to this. Now what we need to do is solve for x. Now I have left this. You know what I'm going to do? Just a second. I just realised. See if I save. I'll explain to you guys now. If I save the file with all the writing on it, then the problem is that then we don't have any space to write. So what we're going to do is that, okay, now, um, <clears throat> so this is what we did yesterday. We had x minus 7 times by 10 to the negative 4 over 0 0.5 is equal to 2.7 times by 10 to the negative 3 squared because it is um, the Kc value, which is going to be the ammonia squared over 0 0.1, which is your nitrogen, um, multiplied by your 1.221 times by 10 to the negative 1 cubed. Okay, right. So now what we need to do is we need to solve for this. So oh, the 0 0.1 was the actual Kc value, by the way. So what we need to do is we need to solve. I just want to see what happened. There's, there's your n. Oh, we saw places. That's right. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to solve for x. So the first thing I want to do is put all of this in a calculator. So let's do that. So we have got on and we've got a fraction we've got two point um i tell you what let's put this in brackets two point two point seven um exponent negative three bracket squared all divided by naught point one multiplied by the bracket of 1.221 1 exponent negative 1 bracket to the power of 3 equals and that becomes 0 comma 0 4 i'm not going to worry about the rest of the stuff so it's 0 comma 0 4 so therefore we have got x minus 7 times by 10 to the negative 4 7 times by 10 to the negative 4 over 0 comma 5 is equal to and what did we say this was 0 0.04 0 comma 0 4 Therefore, we can say that x minus 7 times by 10 to the negative 4 is going to be 0 0.04 times 0 0.5, which is going to give me 0 0.02, 0 comma 0 0.2. Therefore, x is going to be plus 7 exponent negative 4 equals 0 0.0207, 0 comma 0 0.207. But now remember that that, oh sorry, that was the number of moles. That was the moles and they wanted to know the mass. They wanted to know the mass. So because it says after I did it, calculate the initial mass. So we know, sorry, let's try again. We know that number of moles is mass over molar mass. So it is nitrogen gas, so it's going to be 14 times 228. So it's going to be 0, 0, 207 multiplied by 28 is going to give us the mass of nitrogen gas that was used. So if we do that, we're going to go this 
times by 28, which equals 0.58. So the mass equals 0.58 grams. There we go, done. Now it says, explain why such a high temperature is used, although the yield is low. Okay, the reason the temperature, such a high temperature is used is because a high temperature, even if a reaction is exothermic, will always increase the rate of the reaction. So even though the yield is low, the reaction will be happening faster. So that is the reason why the high temperature is used. Right, now it says, hydrochloric acid is highly corrosive, strong acid with many industrial uses. Okay, when 0.02 decimeters cubed of sodium hydroxide is added to 0.15 decimeters cubed dilute hydrochloric acid of concentration, 0.03 moles per decimeter cubed, the pH of the mixture changes to 4. Okay, give a reason why the hydrochloric acid is considered a strong acid. The reason hydrochloric acid is considered a strong acid is because it completely dissociate. It breaks up completely into hydrogen plus ions and chloride minus ions. So you could just say it completely dissociates. Okay, it breaks up completely. Now it says write a balanced chemical equation to show the dissociation of HCl in water. So all that you'd need to write is HCl breaks up into H plus ions plus Cl minus ions. Okay, because, but if you really wanted to show it in water, you could say HCl plus H2O gives you H3O plus plus Cl minus, and uh, that also is balanced. Either way, that would be correct. Now it says, Will the final mixture be acidic or basic? Give a reason for answer referring to the pH of the mixture. It says the pH of the mixture changes to 4. Now 4 is a low number. It's lower than 7. So therefore we could say it's acidic because the pH is smaller than 7. Finally, it says calculate the final concentration of the H plus ions in the mixture. Well, we know that pH equals minus the log of the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions. They tell us that this is 4. So now we know that 4 is equal to minus the log of H plus. Therefore, what we're really going to do is we're going to go second function log or log to negative 1 of negative 4 to get the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions. Okay. So let's do that. So we're going to go shift log of negative 4, and that's going to give us 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4. So it's 1 times by 10 to the negative 4 moles per decimeter cube. That is the concentration of the hydrogen plus ions. Now it says calculate the original concentration of the sodium hydroxide solution. Okay, let's think about this. Um, okay, so we've got sodium hydroxide. Um, okay, NaOH plus HCl is going to change to um, NaCl plus H2O. Okay, that is what is happening. It says originally you're adding 0, 0, 0.02 decimeters cubed is added to 0, 0.15. I know I haven't balanced this, just put a 2 here. I know I don't have to do that at all. There's balance already. Shame. Okay, that's nice and easy. Okay, so that's 0, 0.15 is diluted with a concentration of 0, 0, 0, 0,3 moles. Okay, and it says that they want this concentration. Okay, so now let's have a look at that. Um, we know that CAVA is equal to NA, CBVB over 
NB. So do you agree we can get, we've got the, oh, sorry, I need to sneeze, hang on. So sorry. So we've got the original concentration. We've got the original um, volume of this was, and it says here, is added to 0.15 decimeters cubed diluted hydrochloric acid. Um, so yeah, all we have to do is now substitute this in. So let's do this. Okay, so the concentration of the acid is 0, is 0 0.03. So we've got 0, 0, 0.03. And let's just check that it is balanced. Yes, one sodium, one sodium, one oxygen, one oxygen, two hydrogens, one chlorine. Yes. So 0, 0, 0, 0.03 times the volume of the acid, which is 0, 0.15, all over the volume of the base, which is 0, 0, 0.02 multiplied by the concentration we don't know is equal to one so therefore we can say that the concentration of the base is going to equal to 0, 0, 3 times 0, 0.15 over 0, 0, 2 so let us do that on our calculator um okay so we've got 0, 0.03 multiplied by 0.15 equals divided by 0.02 equals st button st button and that's 0.225 so the original concentration would have been 0.225 moles per decimeter cubed there we go. Not too bad, hey? Right, now it says, calcium carbonate solutions provide living organisms with the substance they need to grow their protective shells and skeletons. For example, eggshells are composed of calcium carbonate. Grave 12 learners decided to calculate the percentage of calcium carbonate in eggshells at STP. Okay, that's an interesting experiment. They take five grams of crushed eggshells and react it with excess hydrochloric acid. Okay, so hydrochloric acid is not affecting the result. So you get calcium carbonate plus 2HCl gives you calcium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water. The carbon dioxide produced is collected and found to be 1,06 decimeters cubed after all the calcium carbonate reacted. It says calculate the percentage of calcium carbonate in the five gram eggshells. Show all the calculations. Okay, so again, grade 12s, what I want to point out to you is that this is stoichiometry, okay? And for a very long time, stoichiometry, although it was officially in the grade 12 curriculum, has been kind of ignored, okay? But it seems like it's a very much definitely a trend right now that you do that it's going to be in the exams so please i would suggest that you make sure you understand how to do this okay so what are we saying let's just write this out again we've got calcium carbonate let's try again <sighs> okay raise link calcium carbonate plus hc2 hcl goes to calcium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water and they said that they used the five grams of crushed eggshell and they got out 1,06 decimeters cubed. Okay, so we don't work with volumes, we work with moles. And this is at STP, there's the hint. So we know that the molar volume at STP is 22.4 decimeters cubed right so therefore we can work out the number of moles of carbon dioxide that is produced the number of moles is going to be 1,06 divided by 22,4 so let us work that out 
So we're going to say 1.06, that's not going to work, 0, 6, divided by 22.4 equals 0.047. So I'm going to write that down, 0.047 at the moment. So that's 0, 0, 47 moles. So that's how many moles of carbon dioxide was produced, right? But now, if you look at that, do you see that the ratio of carbon dioxide to calcium carbonate is one to one, which means that we used up 0, 0, 047 moles of calcium carbonate. So now, in order to work out the percentage of calcium carbonate in the five gram of eggshells, what we need to do is we need to convert this into a mass. So number of moles is mass over molar mass, right? So we need to find the molar mass of calcium carbonate. Now, as I said to you a billion times before grade 12, when you're doing your science, you need to have your periodic table, your redox table, your all your um, formulae, your calculator, pen, pencil, ruler, and obviously paper and brain. Okay, so you need to have all of that available while you are doing science at any one time. So the calcium molar mass is 40. The carbon molar mass is 12 plus 3 times 16. So if we add that up on the calculator, we get 40 plus 12 plus 40 8 equals 100. So the molar mass of calcium carbonate is 100 grams per mole. Right, now what we need to do is we need to work out the, uh, getting there, sorry, we need to work out the number of moles. The number of moles we've got is 0 0.07. We want to work out the mass. So we're going to say the mass is going to be 0, 0, 047 multiplied by 100. So if we take 40, was it 407? No, 0 0.047. So we're going to take this times this by 0. Mm. 0.47, which is going to be 4.7. So this is 4,7 grams. So out of that 5 grams of eggshells, 4.7 was the calcium carbonate. Okay, so now all that we need to do is work out um, what the percentage is. The percentage is going to be 4,7 over 5 divided by times by 100 over 1. Okay, do you agree? So therefore, we can say that this is divided by 5 multiplied by 100 equals, and that's 94%. So that equals 94%. The percentage of calcium carbonate in the 5 gram eggshells is 94%. Okay, very nice question. I like that question a lot. Right, let's have a look at this. An electric chemical cell is set up at standard conditions, as shown below. Okay, the electron flow is indicated. So electrons are given off on that side. So remember, it's oil rig. There is anox and there is red cat. So oxidation is loss of electrons and that means it's given off. So this bit here is the anode, which means that that is the cathode. Right, now it says write down one function and they tell you the reading of the voltmeter is 1,07 volts. Okay, the so write down one function of a salt bridge. Okay, it completes a circuit. One. Okay, what else does it do? It also allows for the um, free flow of ions between the two 
half cells, which therefore allows for the neutrality of the two half cells to remain constant. Okay, which electrode, the cell is the anode? Okay, I've just explained that. They've shown you that the electrons is flowing from the nickel through to X. We don't know what X is, but, okay, we know that electrons being given off. Oxidation is the loss of electrons and oxidation occurs at the anode. Therefore, X nickel is your anode. Now it says use a calculation, identify the unknown metal X. So again, what you guys need to be doing is getting out your redox table. Now I didn't print out a redox table on this um, page because you know when I do it it's actually so small you guys can't read it which is why you guys need to have your redox table right next to you okay so we know the formula goes e theta is equal to e cathode minus e anode okay it's always e theta is equal to e cathode minus e anode Okay, on your formula sheet, it also goes E oxidizing agent. I'm going to just check this. It goes E oxidizing agent minus reducing agent, or yeah, or it goes E reduction minus E oxidation. But since we're doing cathode minus anode, it makes that a lot easier. So now, if we look at this, they tell you that this is 1,07 is E the EMF of the cathode minus the anode, but the anode is nickel. So if we look at the redox table, you can find the reaction, it's about four above the hydrogen, and the value for that is minus 0, 0,25. So therefore, you can take it across. This is obviously minus and minus makes a plus. So that's a plus, right? So therefore, when we take it across, it's a minus. So you're 1, 0, 7 minus 0, 0,25 is going to give the EMF of the cathode. So then what we need to do is pop that into our calculator. So you go 1.07 minus 0, 0.25, no really, Two two five equals and that becomes 0 0.82. So therefore the E is cathode, the image for the cathode is 0, 0,82. And now what we do is we just go and look for 0, 0,82. And if you look on your redox table, there's two that are 0, 0.8. Okay. Uh Let me just think about this. That's so seven, it's and twelve and thirty. Yeah. So there are two. One is um, gas and the other one is silver. So therefore, I would say the correct answer here is that it's metal. They tell you it's a metal, and therefore it has to be silver. Okay, now it says write down the balanced or net oval reaction for the above cell. Now remember you need to write it like this. Okay, so if you have a look at your reactions, we've got nickel, 2 plus, plus 2 electrons gives you nickel, and remember it's reversible, and over here, you've got Ag plus, plus an electron, is in the reversible reaction with silver. Okay, so now, if we rewrite this over here, Remember, we have to write it from the nickel to the nickel 2 plus ions. So it's nickel goes to nickel 2 plus plus 2 electrons. Okay, you then have your Ag plus plus an electron goes to Ag. And guys, please be careful. You cannot write these now with the both arrows going both ways like you did here because now it's actually committed. It can't go backwards, okay? This reaction is going one way and nickel is converting to nickel 2 plus and giving off its electrons. The silver, is, silver ions are accepting those electrons to form silver. And the only thing more we have to do is we have to multiply this by 2 to balance out the electrons. So this is 2, this is 2, and this is 2. So we end up with an overall net reaction is 2 Ag plus 
these cancel, so you get plus nickel forms nickel 2 plus plus 2 AG. And no, it doesn't matter which order you write these in. Right. Excellent. Now it says, now metal X is replaced with zinc. The zinc. Oh, hate it when it does that. Okay, I just want to erase some stuff here so that's out the way. I wonder if I can erase all of it. Right, I can. So let's erase all of it. It says, okay, so now you're replacing this with zinc. Okay, I mean this. Right, it says, for the new galvanic cell, write down the name or formula of the oxidizing agent. Okay, so now we've got zinc and nickel. So now we need to look at where nickel and zinc are with respect to each other. So nickel, zinc is above nickel. So you've got zinc, two plus, plus two electrons, goes to or is in dynamic equilibrium with zinc. And that is negative 0 0.76. And then lower down, there is nickel, two plus, plus two electrons is going to nickel. And this is minus 0.25, minus 0.25. So the interesting thing here is this reaction is actually going to be going the other way. The electrons are going to go the other way. The only way this reaction can occur now is if the reaction goes this way, from zinc to zinc 2 plus to nickel 2 plus plus 2 electrons. In other words, the zinc is going to be giving off electrons, so therefore these electrons are now going to be traveling this way, which means this is now the anode and this is now the cathode. And the anode is where oxidation occurs, which means it's a reducing agent. So this time nickel is going to be the oxidizing agent or nickel itself, Ni or nickel. It says they want the half reaction at the anode. So the half reaction the anode is going to be Zn goes to Zn 2 plus plus 2 electrons. There we go. And now they want the cell notation for the new cell. Okay, so remember the cell notation always goes anode cathode, okay? So the cell notation would be Zn goes to Zn2 plus salt bridge, then it goes nickel 2 plus nickel. And remember that this is in standard conditions, so therefore you have to write either next to Zn2 plus and next to nickel 2 plus or below it, one mole per decimeter cubed, one mole per decimeter cubed. There we go. Okay, not too bad here. Let's move on. Okay, so now, so that was a galvanic cell where we we're producing electricity. Now we're looking at an electrolytic cell where we're actually using electricity to break things down. It says, electrolysis is an important industrial process used to decompose compounds, extract metals from the ores and purify metals like gold and copper. The simplified diagram Below represents an electrolytic cell used in the extraction of aluminium. Okay, fair enough. Okay, these are carbon electrodes. This is aluminium oxide with some molten cryolite to reduce the melting point. There's your molten aluminium. It says write down the energy conversion that takes place in this cell. Okay, so obviously the energy conversion that takes place in this cell is going to be from electrolytic, electrical, to chemical because we are providing it with electricity in order for it to have a reaction. Okay. Now it says write down the name of the mineral ore of aluminium. It is aluminium oxide. Um, another name for it would be bauxite, I think. What they're trying actually asking probably is probably bauxite. The bauxite is actually the mineral ore that at which aluminium oxide would be found. Okay, now it says write down the role played by cryolite. Actually, I've already mentioned this. The role played by cryolite is to reduce the melting point of the bauxite or the aluminium oxide in order for it to be at the temperature at which is 
attainable without too much electricity being used. Okay, moving on. Now it says the carbon rods need to replace from time to time. Write down the balance chemical equation that explains why they need to be replaced. Okay, so what is happening is that the carbon is reacting with oxygen to form carbon dioxide at the electrodes. So it gives off carbon dioxide gas up here, which is why it is bad for the environment. But it also means that we're using up the carbon in the carbon electrodes. So that's why it needs to be replaced quite often. Then it says, write down the half reaction at the cathode. The half reaction at the cathode. Um, in this case, remember that, let me just check this out. We've got oil rig, we've got anox, and we've got um, red cat. So the reaction that's happening at the cathode is going to be aluminium, three plus, plus three electrons is going to form aluminium. Okay, so that is what's happening at the uh, cathode. Now it says write down two negative impacts of the cell on the environment. Okay, so I've already mentioned the fact that we obviously are moving the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and that is a greenhouse gas. So that's obviously really bad. Um, another thing that is pretty bad is the fact that um, it can sometimes leak out into the environment. Thirdly, what happens is this gives off a lot of heat. It is a very hot, hot, hot reaction. This molten cryolite light um, brings the melting temperature down to about 1000 degrees Celsius. So it's still very hot. So obviously what's happening then is that it's bringing this hot um, temperature to the environment and the ecosystem and it's messing with the surrounding temperatures which means then that obviously the the plants are going to suffer from it. It says it's preferable to recycle aluminium products rather than extracting it and give a reason to substantiate the above statement. Well once we have the aluminium uh, products it's very easy to um, just go and clean them up and sort them out versus when we have to import this bauxite from Australia then use this very expensive process to get the aluminium out. Okay, right now now we're on to the fertilizers in the fertilizer industry, um, chemical industry. They are saying that different processes are used in preparation of fertilizer E, okay, are represented in the flow diagram. We've got sulfur and oxygen, um, which obviously is going to make a sulfur dioxide, right? Hang on a minute. Eraser. Sulfur dioxide, which then makes sulfur trioxide which then makes oleum, um, which is H2S2O7, which I'm thinking must make sulfuric acid. When I say thinking, I mean the only thing I can get out of my oleum is my sulfuric acid. The harbor process, we make ammonia, and therefore fertilizer E has to be ammonium sulfate. There we go. And it's ammonium is NH4 plus and sulfate is, so it's actually a two there. Right, now it says, use the above information, write down the name or formula of gas A, okay? The sulfur, this is obviously sulfur dioxide, okay? Or SO2, name the process of X going from SO2 to SO3. That there is the contact process. I know that we're used to calling the whole thing of making sulfuric acid the contact process, but this year is actually the step where it gets its name. And the reason it's called that is because it comes into contact with the catalyst V2O5 or vanadium pentoxide. Okay, formula of oleum, there you go, H2S207, I've already done it. Now it says the balance equation for preparation of fertilizer E. Okay, so that's going to be the ammonia plus sulfuric acid, H2SO4. It gives us ammonium 
But now remember, ammonium is NH4 plus and sulfate is SO4 to minus. So we actually have to multiply that by two to give us SO4, which means we need two nitrogens, okay? And then that gives us six, seven, eight hydrogens. That works, that works, that's it, it's balanced. Balanced, balanced, balanced. How beautiful is that? Right, now it says, done. Describe one negative impact on humans when fertilizers run into the dams and rivers as a result of rain. Okay, this would be eutrophication. I, it says describes, so you can't just name it. You need to explain that the over fertilization of the water results in the plants becoming, or the results in the algae to grow in the dams, which eventually results in death of the fish and of the plant life, and then that water goes off. It says, write down the name of the most important primary nutrient required for the following. Okay, so the primary nutrients are NPK. NPK. We need one for leaf growth, one for root growth, and one for flower and fruit. So, what do you think it is? We've got nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Um, so, the plant nutrients of nitrogen, and nitrogen is very, very important for what? What is nitrogen important for? Nitrogen, as you know, is important for the whole plant growth, and it's important for the vitamins and it affects the energy reactions because it's part of your DNA and part of the amino acids in your proteins. Your phosphorus um, promotes your photosynthesis, respiration, it helps plants to survive, your um, thing, and then your potassium increases your photosynthesis, essential for protein synthesis, important for fruit formation. So your fruit formation is definitely your potassium. Your overall plant growth is your nitrogen and your leaf growth is your um, phosphorus. Phosphorus. Right, which one of the three primary nutrients is absorbed by plants the least? Okay, which one of the three primary nutrients is absorbed by plants the least? And I would say that that would definitely be the phosphorus. The phosphorus. Phosphorus. The most is the nitrogen. Okay. Now it says, consider the structural formula of the organic compound below. So right, we're starting on the next exam paper now and look, it's the end of the lesson. Oh my word. So we'll start this tomorrow. Have a wonderful evening and study well. Cheers.